Hello, everyone, and welcome to Geo for Good Lightning Talk series. Uh, this this month is our twelfth round of doing this talk uh, series, and the theme for this month is people and society. My name is Steve Greenberg, and I lead developer relations for Google Earth and for Earth Engine. So. Last year, we started a series of monthly lightning talks by and for nonprofits, scientists, and other change makers who want to leverage mapping tools and technology for positive impact in the world. And we hope these five minute lightning talks will inspire you to think of new ways that you can have an impact with mapping tools or to provide operational or, or practical hints to improve or optimize your work. Two years ago, the group on Earth Observations and Google Earth Engine announced that 32 projects from 22 countries were awarded production licenses and technical support to tackle some of the world's greatest challenges using open geospatial data. And as this program draws to a close, we're excited for the project teams to share their results and outcomes over these lightning talk episodes. So this month, we're going to hear from five project teams on how they used Google Earth Engine for people and society. Before we kick off the first presentation, I want to call your attention to two quick things. The first is the Q&A feature. If you're watching this live, you can write your question into the Q&A section below this page. Um, if you have a specific question for a, a speaker, please identify which speaker I should direct it to. Write it in the Q&A section, and we will direct it to that person. And the second is the link to the slides, which you can find below in the resource section. All right, let's get started with our first talk. Okay, so the first speaker is Adel. He's the associate professor at the Institute for Analytical Sociology at Linkoping University, and he's the affiliated associate professor in data science and artificial intelligence at Chalmers University of Technology in Sweden. I apologize if I mispronounced any of those names. His research has both a social scientific and a methodological orientation. For the social sciences, he researches the effect of public policies and sudden shocks on global poverty. And for methods development, Adel implements novel methodologies in machine learning, remote sensing, and casual, excuse me, causal inference to analyze poverty. So let's hear his talk. So despite progress uh, that humanity has made over the last century, uh, many children still die uh, globally. And that is because of poverty and unequal access to, to resources. Now, part of the, the problem is uh, that uh, communities might be trapped in so-called poverty traps. Uh, now, to analyze poverty traps, we need a lot of data uh, across different dimensions of poverty. So, for example, here you see access to drinking water that uh, we can characterize to exist in different levels. So the very poorest exist in level one, where they have uh, no access to water uh, in their household, but have to move or travel far to find uh, clean and uh, safe water. Whereas if you compare it to different other dimensions, you see the same uh, type of, of uh, levels of difference uh, over time. Now, if we look at the uh, global population distribution, we see that uh, there are about seven a billion individuals on this planet, a bit more today, uh, but about one seventh of them live in these uh, living conditions that you see uh, here listed on level one. Whereas the richest, which is what we are uh, used to in the Western world, is level four type of uh, living conditions. To analyze uh, the causes and consequences of poverty, uh, we need, as I said, a lot of data. We need these Y variables that exist in different dimensions. Now, because of the lack of geotemporal data on poverty, uh, scholarship is generally limited on the causes uh, uh, of why people are stuck in these poverty traps. So what we do at the AI and Global Development Lab is that we combine AI, Earth observations, and social sciences to analyze the consequences and uh, causes of global development, both historically, geographically, and globally. So our lab currently is generating such uh, data by combining these uh, different uh, disciplines. So what you see here is the city of uh, Cape Town and what we are capitalizing in, in this variation of development within cities. So from 1984 to 2018, uh, 2020, uh, you see these large developments that are occurring within cities. And this is exactly the variation 
that we are capitalizing on. So the problem here is that what we do and how do we do this? Well, basically we have these points that are surveys, survey points that we gather from existing surveys. We then stack them on top of this gridded map and they designate different levels of, of poverty or wealth. The goal is to create this map to the right that you see, uh, that is this heat map. We then temporally stack these uh, slices of data on top of each other. We train a machine learning algorithm on the points where there are uh, survey points that we know. We then impute, use the algorithm to impute where the red line is to gather and see what, how development has occurred over time and space. So developing an algorithm for poverty measurement is one of the goals that we have embarked on. So what we have here is basically this F is the algorithm of interest for countries such as now Burundi, where we don't have data on certain time points, we impute or give the satellite images for this function. And then we generate these maps that uh, are generating Google Earth Engine. So the structure of the algorithm is roughly like you see here, where there's these temporal stack models, uh, you give it impute images, uh, daylight images, nightlight images, processes through the algorithm, outcomes a prediction, and then we connect these with different layers so that the algorithm learns what happens over time in space. So without our project, basically we would be stuck with, for Burundi, we'll do this for the whole Africa, uh, that you have only two time points where there are has household surveys that exist that, that we can use. But with our model, with our projects, with our model that we train, we are able to impute this series of, of data that is then our data product that we will release uh, to the community. So in the end, we'll create these living condition maps or poverty maps uh, that uh, are hosted on Google Earth Engine, but also we can download them uh, for further analysis and, um, and different statistical packages. And what we are doing basically here is that the goal, as I said, is to train this model, then use this model for analyzing the, the causes and consequences of poverty. The approach is combining deep learning and different ground truth models from demographic and health surveys combined with Landsat satellite images. And we, uh, at the current moment, have generated these data that live uh, on our website, but also on Google Earth Engine. And we are in the process of developing these models further. Thank you very much. All right, thanks. Um, Adel, I found that to be an incredibly inspiring talk when I watched it. And, um, you know, one of the things I think about here is, is fairness and transparency in the model itself, because these are incredibly high stakes, uh, high impact conclusions that you're reaching. So what steps do you take to make sure your model is fair and transparent? That's a, an excellent, uh, excellent remark. So what we um, are, are currently focused on is really just getting the sort of the prediction rate as, as, as high as possible. So getting basic measurements uh, is, is really the, the, the goal here. And then the second step is to uh, then use those things to also get predictive uncertainties to be like basically narrow down how well we can measure these things. The second thing is really to think about these fairness questions and, and transparency. We aren't really at that stage yet where we are mm -hmm. sort of uh, reasoning uh, uh, precisely about these things, but we uh, are sort of incorporating the, the, the privacy aspect and the fairness aspect uh, to this so to make it sort of widely available for these communities. That's great. And it's also interesting to hear that the uncertainty is something that you're already measuring. Well, thanks a lot, Adel. And there'll be more time at the end of the presentation for questions for all of our speakers. Um, but you. I think I'm going to move on next to our second speaker. Um, our next speaker is Rudy Yanto. He's a lecturer uh, in the program of crop science at the Faculty of Fisheries and Food Science at the University of Malaysia, Terengganu. And I, again, I apologize for pronunciation problems. His research is related to modeling and the estimates of soil hydro hydraulic properties for complete soil moisture ranges, developing pedotransfer functions, and developing near real time and automated monitoring and mapping of rice extent, intensity, and growth stages in global scale using advanced remote sensing technology. Let's check out this talk. Hi, everyone. My name is Rudianto. I am from University of Malaysia Terengganu, UMT. So on behalf of Buddy Watch team, let me present our project 
under GEO GE program. So the title is Bodywatch Automated Near Real Time Mapping and Monitoring of Rice Growth Extent and Stage. So our team Ramisa, Nur Hidayah, and Budiman Minasti from University of Sydney. So rice is a staple food and primary source of nutrient for the people who are living, especially in the Asian country. So up to date and accurate spatial temporal information of growth stage and harvest state by the rice are necessary. Especially it can be used to tackle food security issue and then it also can be used to measure achievement of SDG2, zero hunger, and self sufficiency level of rice. And then there are several methods that can be used to map uh, rice extent. The popular one is rice penology based approach. In this approach, the uniqueness of rice field can be cut strike. For example, transplanting, which is can be present by standing water, and then the growth stage can be characterized by increasing chlorophyll or greenness rapidly until three months, and then maturity uh, that can be evaluated by decreasing chlorophyll for a month, and then the long of growing season is around for to five months depend on variety so using this approach uh, remote sensing technology can be used to identify rice field so during transplanting we can use modified normalized different water index that can be used to detect uh, transplanting period and then for growth maturity and growing season can be Identify by using normalized difference vegetation index or NDVI. So this approach we implemented in our apps. We call it Paddy Watch. So in this, this app is the first online app for Paddy Field monitoring in the tropical region with near real time information Paddy growth stage. And then our apps also process the data in the cloud. Uh, then it run synchronously with the user access time. And then the app will produce automatically the last result to the user. So the our apps can be accessed from this uh, link. And then our apps also provide spectral penology chart for any location that can be defined by the user. Then also can perform aggregation of region showing the particular stage, area in bar and p chart. Then for the dissemination, we have to introduce body watch to IADA Integrated Agriculture Development Area, Barat Laut Selangor, Malaysia. This agency are under Ministry of Agriculture and Food Industry. And then we also introduce uh, the Paddy Watch apps to Malaysia Remote Sensing Agency. Then they are very interested with this app. Then it's possible to make research collaboration in the future. Then we also publish two articles in the remote sensing. First, high, remote, high resolution mapping of body rice extent and growth states across peninsular Malaysia using a fusion Sentinel-1 and 2 time series data in Google Engine. And then the second one is automated near real-time mapping and monitoring of rice extent, cropping pattern, growth states in the Southeast Asia using Sentinel-1 time series uh, on a Google Earth Engine platform. Then in conclusion, Paddy Watch, which is cost-effective app, 
can be extend further for monitoring paddy rice growth stage in other tropical region. So thank you for watching. Thanks. That was uh, awesome, and um, I, uh, I I was particularly. Uh, Excited to see the use of Earth Engine apps as a member of the Earth Engine team uh, used for Paddy Watch. Uh, I'll also say that I went uh, when I was looking at this presentation yesterday to uh, the link that Rudianto has on his slides for the app. Tried it out, and it is as cool as it looks. Um, sadly, Rudianto could not be here today, so we're going to move on to our next speaker. Um, the next speaker is Charles. Charles is the founding partner and executive vice president of ImageCat, where he directs a team of engineers scientists and programmers developing software tools and novel analytical methods to assess risk. He has over 25 years of GIS analysis and application development experience, integrating advanced geospatial technologies into disaster simulation tools and CAT modeling programs, including experience conducting loss estimation, CAT modeling, and risk assessments for river flooding, coastal flooding, and so on. So let's hear his talk. All righty. Um, thanks, everybody. I'm going to be uh, presenting the Global Economic Disruption Index, which me and my team put together on a NASA grant with funding from GEO uh, to, for a Google Earth Engine license, which we really appreciated. And this was really a moonshot idea, really uh, out there, uh, high risk, high reward uh, effort um, to basically address a problem uh, in the field of um, disaster risk management. And that is that disasters kind of have a tipping point. And that tipping point um, is where economies don't really perform uh, very well anymore um, because of cascading failures, typically due to um, uh, critical infrastructure disruption. You can think of this like uh, with a Katrina or Tohoku, where um, critical, critical infrastructure is damaged uh, and that causes um, that that causes economic cascading effects where people can't go back to work and you're no longer uh, able to bounce back. Um, and this is a huge problem uh, in disaster management um, because they're very difficult to model. So you don't know where you've got these accidents waiting to happen. You can't price insurance right. You can't make mitigation um, decisions correctly in order to to um, to characterize these massive catastrophic events. So the question that we had is, can EO be used to characterize the potential for this long-term economic disruption? And the uh, basic uh, um, premise was that regions of production and critical infrastructure are generally visible. You can see them here uh, in Bangkok in white. Um, you can detect them through uh, image segmentation, which was what we used the Google Earth Engine platform to do. Once you do that, you can overlay global hazard data sets and then use standard um, uh, CAT modeling techniques to basically um, characterize the resilience and the vulnerability of the country to uh, impede production digitally, so to speak, uh, and, and put that off into uh, um, input, output, and other economic models to be able to characterize um, the economic disruption. So this was our overall uh, theory. We took that to an India pilot, uh, and we're able to uh, establish that um, it worked or it seemed to work um, for probabilistic events. So uh, like a hundred year flood, looking at all throughout the, the country of India. Um, uh, impending events, that's an actual uh, typhoon that, um, that came uh, to the coast. We were able to identify areas that actually were the hardest hit and then climate condition events. So that's looking in the future, um, given a certain climate scenario and sea level rise uh, on top of what you expect surge to be where you might have um, the greatest economic uh, um, disruption from those type of events. I think in this case, it was a hundred year event on top of sea level rise. So this seemed to work we, uh, with the red areas do indicate where uh, it makes sense to have uh, the hardest impact areas or in one case where you did have the hard impact, uh, hardest impact areas. So given that success, we decided to go back to the drawing board and make these red areas a little bit more meaningful, make this scale a little bit more meaningful, not just a thematic map. So what we did is we came up with JEDA, Global Economic Disruption Index, a ranking system that you might use along with um, a category of event, a category of storm to, to basically characterize the amount of disruption. Uh, and this is just a, an abbreviated version, but you can think of it in terms of uh, uh, on one might be hours, hours to a day, two might be days to a week, weeks might be weeks to, to a month, 
Uh, four might be months to a year. Uh, and then five catastrophic might be many years um, um, to, to, um, to bounce back. So this goes on top of your estimate of what the dollar value might be or the, the, the casualties might be to basically indicate where you might have um, huge issues that might cause uh, relocation of major economic centers or actually migration out of areas as you, as you saw in Katrina. So um, we went back to the drawing board uh, with, uh, with the analysis and so, to see if we could characterize that for hurricanes in the Southeast. And what we did was we took some hurricanes, trained a model, and then went back in the historic records to see how well we could predict um, um, the economic um, disruption from those events. And essentially what we found is it's as good as what we could determine from the literature. We were able to basically characterize uh, how long uh, the economy uh, would be out and what might happen to the economy and the critical infrastructure given an event of a certain size. And we see this as being very useful um, for real-time advisories. You know, you can connect this to like a Shakecast uh, advisor from USGS or a NOAA uh, alert. It's very useful for corporate uh, real estate and um, global interests that have uh, interests all over the globe. They don't necessarily know exactly where they are and they don't know what the risk is associated with these areas. And they're trying to get a handle on what's going to happen with climate change. So you can use this type of a modeling system to, to identify uh, those, those hazards. Uh, it can be an extension to cap modeling tools, kind of as we demonstrated here, there for India. Um, and it can be able to, you can use it to, to prioritize infrastructure projects uh, in the developing world, for example, or identify where you might have that um, nuclear power plant that's a, that is susceptible to surge or where that really needs to be hardened. And that's what I got. Thanks very much. Thanks, Charles. That's very, uh, you know, important and, and sobering work. Um, I guess one question I have for you is, are there some uh, conclusions that the model drew that surprised you, either areas or events that were more likely to be catastrophic or less likely to, to get impact? Well, I think that uh, one of the things that surprised us was how applicable it was to different areas than we anticipated that we were modeling. You know, once we started, once, once we drilled down all the way to looking at economic impact, then we were able to apply it to things like social vulnerability, ESG. And as we started knocking on doors, people were like, well, you know, we've got these problems. We don't know how to model them. Maybe this is applicable. And we've been able to sort of integrate it into a lot of things. And that's come up with some strange uh, results. For example, you know, looking at um, the black community in Los Angeles for earthquakes, that was something that we found that um, they're a lot more vulnerable than the would be commonly reflected if you just looked at the direct impact. If you look at what happens with um, uh, infrequent events and the, considering the economic disruption, then you start to think, well, maybe the, um, the cost benefit analysis and the way that we prioritize mitigation uh, needs to start to incorporate these things for uh, the considerations of social vulnerability. And TCFD, um, SEC are starting to come up with lots of regulations that, uh, that businesses have to follow. And they don't really have the tools to do that and they can't spend all their time collecting all of that data this gives people a good kind of quick look at um you know what the risk might be globally so that they can um essentially um manage the risk accordingly in terms of insurance or dropping assets even that's that's amazing and it's so important yeah. to sort of get that equity lens onto uh onto the work so that you have real data uh, around the communities that are going to be affected so thank you very much yeah. okay we'll move on to our fourth talk um, our next speakers are Wafa and Mohammed. Wafa is the Chief of Economic Statistics at the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for West Africa. Assisting Arab countries in statistical capacity building in implementing statistical standards, such as the system of national counts and the system in, of environmental economic accounting in relation to sustainable development goals in collaboration with the United Nations Statistics Division, other United Nations agencies, and many other partners. Mohammed has a master's in business analytics. He also works at the United Nations Economic and Social Commission for West Asia. Uh, Mohammed's main focus is typically machine learning, but he shifted to earth observation for this topic. So let's watch the talk. Yes, hello everyone. Uh, we'll be talking about remote sensing for flood monitoring and disaster management in local communities in the Nile Basin and coastal areas in Egypt. 
Um, just an overview, there are many challenges uh, in, in Arab countries, uh, socioeconomic and environmental. We list a few of them. Uh, on top of all that, disasters uh, present more obstacles in the way uh, of progress toward achieving the sustainable development goals and the Agenda 2030. And UN ESQA uh, is working with other regional commissions and uh, UN DRR on disaster-related statistics, and we're developing uh, frameworks and uh, organizing forums for that. Working with the statistical offices in the countries, uh, usually they work on, of, on uh, traditional data sources, how they collect the data using census, surveys, etc. But with new technologies, uh, we are advocating the use of Earth observation to produce more timely, more frequent and disaggregated data. Uh, we were lucky to, uh, to, to, to be granted a project uh, with Google Earth Engine. Uh, on the uh, flood monitoring. The objectives were to explore new data sources and integrate it with official statistics, test the effectiveness of remote sensing to detect the disaster at local community levels, and then uh, estimate the damages caused by the disaster and share the algorithms with users. So um, for the actual application on Google Earth Engine, we uh, studied uh, primarily Egypt, and specifically areas around the Nile Basin, the North Coast, the Red Sea Coast, anywhere where we can find population uh, density, uh, agricultural activities, and other uh, beneficial economic activities. And uh, the time period that we were looking at was between 2015 and 2020. So uh, one flood that we detected was in 2015, where around 25 people died, 26 people were injured, and uh, the flood impact also included a political aspect, which uh, which led basically the, to the resignation of the governor over criticism because uh, his administrations uh, lacked uh, uh, preparation and uh, adequate uh, uh, management for the city's drainage system, which led to the flash flood. And on the bottom right, you can see the uh, flooded areas that we were able to detect, and. Another uh, flood that we also found was in 2016, which uh, was uh, caused by heavy, uh, heavy rains, um, inappropriate uh, infrastructure, and the, it led to around 26 deaths, 72 injuries, 6,500 families that needed uh, emergency food, shelter, and water. And for that particular flood, uh, we were able to use social media data to validate what we detected through uh, satellite imagery, the imagery of which we can see on the bottom right of the uh, PowerPoint. And finally, for 2020, we also found uh, another set of localized floods around uh, Karun Lake, around Wadi and Natrun. And this flood also led to airports shutting down and ports shutting down, which uh, obviously affected uh, economic activity within the country. Yes, so one more thing also in many of those areas, very highly uh, historical sites are affected. And this takes another uh, very important uh, study that we have to, to work on. Now, the main challenges of the study was that uh, uh, the, the local statistical offices uh, need more mandate to work on remote sensing, need to help their uh, staff to build their capacities and need to coordinate better with other agents. The opportunities were that um, we were able to uh, generate more inclusive flood maps, uh, even for small communities. Uh, and then um, the people were able to see their posts on social media to support the disaster analysis. And then what we're doing now to just um, uh, develop the tools to share with everyone who want to use it and a guide on how to use um, Earth Observation and GEE in general. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much for that talk. And I also want to quickly say, I think I said West Africa when I was introducing uh, UN Esqua. It is West Asia. Apologize for that. Um, Wafa and Mohammed, can you describe the data and the signals in remote sensing data that were most useful in your model for detecting these floods? Um, sure thing. Uh, yeah. So 
like uh, we saw we saw in the presentation, most of these floods were a direct result of uh, heavy rainfall and inadequate uh, infrastructure. So, uh, and as a result of that, you can expect a lot of uh, clouds. So, multispectral images weren't really useful mm -hmm. for us. Uh, we had to rely mostly on radar imagery, so Sentinel One specifically. That's super interesting. And, so, keep going. Yeah, so uh, and we basically used radar uh, with uh, specifically um, VV backscatter, uh, if you're familiar with the bands in uh, Sentinel-1. And, th and that was actually the most useful um, data-wise data, data -wise, uh, for us uh, to, to be able to actually detect floods. That's, that's really interesting. Thanks. Wafa, do you want to add, add anything? Something. Yes, uh, we we needed uh, badly like um, uh, data on crop maps, uh, and uh, unfortunately in Egypt they don't have this data. And we uh, reached out to FAO um, uh, in in Egypt, uh, so they do just um, surveys of the crops and annual. Uh, so this is a backdrop because we couldn't really. Uh, you know, use what crops, uh, what type of uh, damage to agricultural areas. Uh, whereas in other countries, they have the crop maps uh, and, and they are available. That's great. So you were you had to you had to find that information yourselves. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to move on to our last talk. Um, the last speaker is Elio. He is the researcher and lead data scientist at the National Institute for Statistics and Geography in Mexico. Elio's interests include machine learning, neural networks, and data science applications with high social impact. Currently, he is working on research projects to develop modern methods to take advantage of alternate data sources to produce experimental statistical and geographical products at the national level. So let's check out his work. Hello, this project is a collaboration between the National Institute of Statistics and Geography, the National Polytechnic Institute of Mexico, and the University of California at Santa Cruz. Poverty is a complex problem with many phases. One of these phases is the emergence of and proliferation of vulnerable settlements. Last year, the scene in the picture happened at El Cerro del Chiquihuite, in the hills just outside Mexico City. The cause of the disaster was not an earthquake, but an intense rainy season. Human settlements with a scarcity of services and bad conditions in the households are the consequence of non-inclusive development. People living in these conditions are particularly vulnerable to natural hazards and are living far from well-being. Based on data from the National Population Census 2020, CONEVAL, the National Council of Evaluation of Mexico, states that 17.9% of the Mexican population live without access to essential services and 9.3% live without quality and adequate spaces in their homes. Commonly, these people live in deprived urban areas or remote and isolated rural territories. Unfortunately, countrywide census exercises are conducted only sporadically every 10 years in Mexico, making it challenging to track policies, short-term effect, and on reducing poverty. This project uses machine learning and remote sensing methods to identify vulnerable settlements nationwide Time, timely and efficiently. Here is a graphical summary of the method, methodology that we follow. Census data is associated with a satellite image through residential block locations to construct machine learning algorithms training data sets. We first consider data from 2010 national census and 2010 Landsat image. To characterize vulnerable settlements, we observe variables like sufficient living space, access to sanitation, drainage, drainage access, structural quality and durability of construction materials, safe water access, and electrical energy access. We must mention that the selection of these variables is based on the UN habitat definition of SLUM. We calculate an indicator of vulnerability as an average of these values for each residential block, and then associate this vulnerability indicator to an image patch of 20 per 20 pixels 
with a center in the centroid of each residential block polygon. We experiment with distant deep learning algorithms, <coughs> models, and evaluate them. At the end, the model, based on efficient net developed by Google, gives the best performance. Moreover, this model can identify the prime areas over all the national territory with a rock value of 0 0.94, which is a very competitive value considering similar exercise done with a higher resolution image, but in a tiny portion of the national territory. Using Google Earth Engine app, one can explore and the identify vulnerable settlements over all Mexican territory. One can observe vast regions to see the sprawl of this kind of settlement in the development of urban systems. Or zoom into a specific region to observe a detailed distribution of these settlements at a residential block level. For example, here is a very populated area of Mexico City where <coughs> we can see the transition between the urban region and a good, with good access to services and living conditions and highly vulnerable part with many shortcomings. Now, within these results, we have developed a new methodology to estimate vulnerability in such a way that we aggregate these estimations. We can find a very close correlation with the official statistics related to poverty. Remarkably, the poverty index dimension associated with the lack of services and quality housing deprivation correlates with estimation based on the vulnerable sentiments in identification with a R square correlation coefficient of 0 0.99. Sorry, 0 0.89. Moreover, we can show how this vulnerability has evaluated in the last 30 years, given the availability of Landsat image. Finally, given that official statistics for poverty are given, given every five years at a municipality level, we think that with these results, we can provide decision and policy makers with a tool that allows them to evaluate timely poverty mitigation policies. Thank you for attending to this, to this lighting talk. I will be happy to answer your questions. Uh, Elio, thank you so much for this in incredibly important talk. Um, I was what in your slides on one of the slides there was a there was a line chart that showed evolution of vulnerability and it, it did look like it was going down. Is that an indication that overall poverty is decreasing? Well, <clears throat> maybe maybe it is. Uh, uh, you, you have to uh, analyze each, each place as its own. In the case that we show is the Acapulco Bay, that is a very tourist, touristic place in the south side of the Pacific, Mexico. Mm -hmm. uh, and in, in that moment, in 2010, I think that is the moment that, that the territory for living space is full and there are a lot of uh, places with the scarcity of services, and the, the situation becomes better uh, as, as, as it uh, evolves in, in time. Uh, I think that is the interpretation of that, that series. Of that particular yes. data. Yes. That makes sense. And it also sounds like it's incredibly important to pay attention to particular regions uh, and really focus in on the regional story, uh, which obviously the, the satellite data remote sensing helps quite a bit with. That's right. Uh, thank you very much for your work. All right, that's, that wraps up our, our last talk. So thank you very much to all our presenters for great talks. Um, we're gonna take general questions right now. So please feel free to add any questions you have uh, to the Q&A section. We'll keep that open for a bit. Um, while you're adding questions, I'll uh, take this opportunity to welcome Rudy Yanto to the talk. Thank you for coming. Um, we, did, yes. we saw your talk about Patty Watch earlier um, and didn't have a chance to ask you any questions. So I just wanted to say I, I really enjoyed uh, seeing the talk and seeing the application. And I'm wondering uh, if you can tell me a little bit about how structuring it as an Earth Engine app might have been useful in communicating the data to, 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 to stakeholders like uh, the organizations at uh, IADA. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, we can, yes. 
Yes, we can hear you. Yes, uh, this app will be very important yeah, for them. So it can help the like IADA. So this is one part of Ministry of Agriculture. So they can monitor yeah, their uh, rice extent area. <clears throat> and then the one of the important things, uh, uh, they need to to determine yeah, the rice extent area, uh, whether it is convert or not. Yeah. Right. So convert they they draw the ready. rice extent. Yeah. Yes. Sorry, keep going. And then after that, it, it is, uh, can help government to estimate yeah, the rice extent that related to self-sufficiency level whether it is achieved or not. Thank you so much. So they're focusing in yes. on the area that of interest for themselves. That is great. Um, thanks. Uh, I'm going to keep moving on to some of the questions that I've seen in, in, in the chat, Raleigh. Uh, but if you want, if there are any others, feel free to put them in here. Um, for Adel, it sounds like the DHS survey data was important for this project. Um, as you think about scaling to other countries, is this type of data widely available or will you need other household surveys to be done? Yeah, so we, we have um, the demographic health survey is widely available in low and middle income countries, uh, starting from reliably being measured from the 1990s, early 1990s uh, up to date, still being measured. And the benefit there is that it's standardized across these countries. Uh, roughly speaking, the same surveys. There are some variations in modules, uh, but roughly speaking, they're they're measuring the same thing. Um, now, if we want to extend this globally, like fully going global, ca capturing you know North America, uh, Europe, and so on and so forth, we need to standardize again, yet again. So we would probably go with something like income uh, that would be the measure of of interest. But that is also hard because it doesn't usually come with with a geo uh, GIS tag at the neighborhood level. Got it. Okay. That's really interesting. Thanks. Um, let's see. I'll move on to a question for Charles. Um, how are the medium to long-term climate change impacts affecting the model? How are they being integrated into your catastrophe model? Well, that's, um, that's an interesting question. What we do is we depend on others who determine what the hazard is uh, for us. So we, we incorporate, you know, a flood hazard, for example, um, <clears throat> uh, coastal surge, um, and, and what we, we've done is uh, integrated new hazard layers to reflect, say, an RCP 8.5, 2050, 2070 scenario for those flood and surge um, hazards, for example, so that people can actually start to forecast what the, the economic impact may be given future climate scenarios. So it's, it's very handy for that. Okay, that's great. Yeah. Um, all right, a question for Wafa and for Mohammed. Um, you mentioned that you used social media data, that, that people saw their own uh, sort of experiences reflected in the model. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Or was the, was the social media data in, incorporated into as an input to the model? Uh, so the social media data was uh, used to validate our results, to make sure like anything that we uh, delimited on the map, anything that we were able to predict on the map was actually uh a real case of a flood and we have the images to prove it thanks to everyone that's uploading their images onto twitter we also actually looked at um uh, extracting uh through uh, nlp the uh, different uh, disasters that are happening for a monitoring tool but this is ongoing and uh, on the site and it's as a direct result of uh, the project we started with ge Got it. Wafa, well, if you're talking, you are muted. I can add just something quickly. Uh, we tried also with a search sample uh, to use like the Arabic language because some of the tweets mm. are in Arabic. And then like Muhammad said, uh, to, to, to use an NLP to catch this. Uh, but it was very difficult to, to do the exact words that that people use, you know, in in case of um, like, uh, different types of, of disasters. But uh, we, we're still working on this uh, with the research center. 
That's really interesting. Thank you. Um, I'll finish with just a quick um, a question to everyone, sort of an open question. Um, if you could wave a magic wand, what feature or capability would you like to see added to Earth Engine in order to help you further your work? Uh, open question to whoever wants to take it. Well, perhaps even faster computing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's you, fair enough. That's faster processing. That's like the standard, standard uh, sort of ask. I would say that's, that's great. Thank you, but but it's a great tool. I mean, without it, would have been this would have been like impossible to do at all. So I think I think where we stand today, and given that it's like free for researchers, it's an amazing uh, facility uh, for for research and for policymakers. So so well done on that. Thank you, Adol. That's great to hear. Uh, we'll we'll get, get working on the more on faster computers as well. Uh, anybody else? Yes, and may I add, Adel, you talked about surveys, and we saw in Mexico they used census. So mm. maybe uh, having those uh, maps from countries would be very very helpful. That makes sense. Census maps from particular countries. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, that's great. Um, Wafa, thank you. That's a great idea for a new data set. Any other data sets that folks would like to see added? To the catalog and there is this uh, website called adata.org uh, that hosts a lot of uh, uh, geotag data so everything from world bank you know chinese programs that are located uh, across the globe that would be a fantastic asset to, to also link to the uh, google Earth engine that's great thanks i'll take a look and elio you looked like you might have wanted to say something yes <clears throat> maybe higher resolution images mm -hmm. that would be great great you know, this might actually be in there already. I don't know. But uh, one of the things that we're trying to, to figure out is how to provide services to other platforms through an API that might call Google Earth Engine. Um, I don't know how hard that's going to be to do or if it's actually embedded in there somewhere. Uh, yeah. There are patterns for doing it today, but definitely some of them can be better documented and there's more piping, always more sort of like pipelining and interoperability work to do. In fact, yeah. I think that's my next meeting right after this one is talking about that topic. Well, you can tell um, as requested. I, I, I will. Uh, I'm going to take this opportunity to wrap us up. Um, thank you all for, for the great talks here. And um, a special thank you to our speakers for presenting today. Thank you to the audience for engaging and listening and asking some of these questions. We hope you're inspired to go uh, with these ideas to go some, and do your own research. Uh, so again, thank you so much and stay tuned for our next Lightning Talk series. Goodbye for now. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.